you are tuned in to a fireside chat with Zany Mystic. Join us now on another exciting metaphysical journey. Relax, tune in, drop out, and take a seat by the fire as we explore new realms and possibilities. This is Magenta Pixie. You can find me at magentapixie.weebly.com. But now, here is Zany Mystic and guest. Enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to A Fireside Chat with Zany Mystic. I'm your host, Lance White. T- today, my guest is Dr. Carmen Bolter. Dr. Bolter is a professor at the University of Calgary in Canada. She has been researching and writing about the sacred feminine and goddess in ancient Egypt around the world for two decades. Her book, Angels and Archetypes, An Evolutionary Map of Feminine Consciousness, traces fragments of information about matriarchal cultures in pre-dynastic Egypt, prehistoric Greece, and around the world. Since 1995, Carmen has been leading sacred site journeys to Egypt, the Mediterranean, Peru, and Tibet. She has traveled to 51 countries exploring ancient mysteries. Her new two, her new two DVD set, The Pyramid Code, is a magnificent revelation and exploration in five complete programs. It's a moving documentary which contains astounding new information which, uh, frankly, I've never seen before on the screen. So let's welcome Carmen to the show now and found out, find out more. Hi, Carmen. How are you? Good. Hi, Lance. Hey. Well, I just wanted to compliment you on the on the pyramid code. I can't urge people enough to, to, to see it, to get it, because you do a, a, an incredible job in those five segments of weaving together a, a vast, multidimensional uh, uh, composite of information that uh, I've never seen before or heard. It's hard to find original material these days, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. Well, I guess the truth is out there, isn't it? It's true. Um, it certainly is. <laughs> uh, one of the things that uh, that uh, enchanted me about the film, uh, I, I kind of fell in love with Hakeem uh, when I... You know, started watching. Um, I, at first, uh, I didn't know who he was. I, I'm not a scholar, and I haven't researched Egyptology that much. But he was so deep, wise, and knowledgeable, and charming. Could you share a bit about how Hakim, what he told you, and who he was? Uh, Hakim has passed now. It's going to be two years in August. Uh, he's an indigenous, was an indigenous wisdom keeper who was raised in the village of Abusir at the foot of the pyramids. And um, he also did training as an archaeologist in the in Scandinavia, and he's one of the original guides, tour guides in Egypt. He was like number fifty on the list, and now they're up to eight thousand seven hundred or something. Mm. So, um, so he understood and knew the ancient language of Suf, uh, which is related to Sufism, but that's the language before Arabic in uh, in the land of Kempt, which is mm. what Egypt was before. So he's not coming from the scholarly, recent, traditional Egyptological perspective. He's coming from a deeper truth that has been passed down through the ages through stories. Well, he certainly shares the information as you do, and and you have others, others, notable scholars on the on the DVD, who uh, all bring their insights and their wisdom to uh, bear on what what's really happening. Now, the pyramids. Um, what? Let me see, where can we go with this? Um, from your research and insight, do you have a working theory about the pyramids and their their real purposes and their age as well? Well, um, again, it's going to be difficult to prove that definitively, but what I've been looking to do is uh, create a, a context to make sense of what the pyramids are. So um, for sure they're going to be multidimensional and, and multipurpose. Uh, they span over such a long period of time that they would have had different uses at different times. And I think that the 2450 BC date that traditionalists give is the most recent restoration. 
So, you know, your house could have easily been built in 1965 and had its last paint job in 2008. <laughs> and so that doesn't mean it was built in 2008. Right, right. And so um, I, it, it, there's a whole network of underground passageways. The Nile used to run right beside the uh, pyramid fields in front of the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx. And it's it most certainly, uh, it has to do with an energy uh, production, uh, passive energy, uh, non-polluting implosion energy, as Hakeem would say, as opposed to our static electricity that's more explosive. It has to do with the... Uh, transmutation of the atom and the water molecule to separate out the oxygen and the hydrogen, and they were able to harness that power. Uh, the pyramids themselves, their placement, absolutely correspond to a sky-ground correlation, and so there's a configuration between Orion, who's pointing his sword toward the Pleiades, and with Sirius behind him, and they call it the dog star, because mm-hmm. a dog follows along behind us, and so there's six distinct sites uh, north and south of the Great Pyramid, and Abu Rausch is the northernmost point that corresponds to Sirius. Uh, the Great Pyramid second and third correspond to the belt of Orion, and Abu Sir, uh, w- which is adjacent to the village that Hakim was born in, it corresponds to the Pleiades, and then the Celestial Nile, the Nile or the Milky Way, um, would have run along to the east. If you go into Starry Night Pro and put in all of those planetary systems and the Milky Way, you'll see that the exact position of the Nile, as it was um, several millennia ago, and these star systems exactly align. But what's more important is that they don't align at specific times. They align all the time. So Mm. if you go back 50,000 years and run 50,000 years forward in that 100,000-year period, that configuration stays together. So it's almost as if the Egyptians knew that X marks the spot, and this is our place in the galaxy. Mm-hmm. It's also that we're moving into the, the alignment in 2012 with the center of the galaxy, and it seems that the ancients also understood that. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, of course, I don't want to get sidetracked, but the Mayan culture is is being spotlighted for the most part about the 2012 phenomenon. But um, you may, this all ties together. Uh, with 2012 and the 26,000 year cycles, uh, aren't we in, and that's also, uh, mapped over the, the Hindu teachings about the various ages. Um, where are we at in that 26,000 year cycle and how does that relate to the pyramids? Um, in a 26,000 year cycle, we are at the very bottom of the 13,000 years. It starts out as a golden age. Uh, Plato talked about it as the great year. It gets denser and denser into a silver age, bronze age, iron age, but then the iron age becomes darker and darker and darker. And so the turning point that's going to return us back up into the second half of the iron age and back up, though, we're we're actually climbing toward the golden age again. Um, The demarcation point is, of course, winter solstice, December 21st, 2012. And so... We're just about to hit the transition where things could start getting a bit better. So rather than in a lot of New Age uh, um, people uh, that are out there are saying that we're actually moving into the Golden Age, but technically uh, this is a cycle or a circle, and we're, we're simply moving or revolving around, so that's the tilting point that will take us back into the Silver Age again and on the way to the Golden Age? Is that... Well, it goes... It goes iron, bronze, silver, golden, and the peak of the golden age is 13,000 years from 2012. So, but the thing is, is that this is a metaphor I like to offer, uh, particularly in the northern hemisphere. Uh, as we're approaching Christmas or winter solstice, uh-huh. it gets darker and darker, and the days are shorter and shorter, and it's very difficult indeed. And that's why we start playing around with our Christmas lights and candles huh. and that sort of thing. Uh-huh. And then when it hits solstice, the very next day is a little bit longer and the next a little bit longer. But the day after solstice is as long as the day before solstice. But because we're densifying and it's getting worse and worse, we feel worse and worse. Yes. When we turn the corner and then we have one a little bit more light, because we're heading toward the light, we feel better. And I think that's the metaphor. So we're not going to instantly be in a golden age, but we are going to be moving away from that period. Now, what about the idea that there will be, uh, because of the position of our planet in the Milky Way, we're tipping into the other part of the galaxy, 
uh, aren't there supposed to be some kind of uh, frequency changes and there's some things going on with the magnetics and the Earth's uh, shield as well? And solar flares in 2012 are supposed to reach their maximum. Do those play into this at all? Well, they do, and I think it, it's quite a stressor on the whole solar system. And um, nobody knows what's going to happen. And yeah. psychics who have been pretty good at doing predictions for decades suddenly draws a line where they can't look into the future. Huh. And the thing that gets me, though, about Armageddon and it's going to get worse and worse and the whole world's going to fall apart is it robs us. It puts it, it, it contributes to the fear soup that we live in. But yeah. It robs us of the possibility that this horrible, horrible bloodbath, blood from death instead of blood from life, uh, could actually come to a bit of a close. Now, when they're telling us about Armageddon and Doomsday and all of that, they're using images of the tsunami that already happened, the volcanoes that already happened. Uh-huh. And I'm not saying that we're not going to have a little bit of disruption as we go through this portal into a new way of being and thinking. But I think that the vast majority of what's going to happen has happened. Now, it's very difficult to be optimistic in this day and age with the Gulf oil spill and everything else. Um, and it's shaking us down into understanding that there's something wrong with what's going on and that uh, we can wake up. And so yeah. I still feel optimistic that this turning point is actually going to bring us into higher levels of consciousness that will return us to something that gives us a semblance of what the Egyptians were already knew and lived in a way that upheld different values. Mm, yes, and you know, you bring uh, bring to light uh, something that it has been intentionally covered up. Uh, we don't. I guess we don't know when uh, some of the evidence of the various pharaohs was destroyed, but um, there were many. There was a. There were long periods when there was a matriarchal uh, society that was in harmony with the male side, and the matriarchs or the divine feminine side was actually the ruling side for for quite a long time, and they lived peacefully. Um, how does that, uh, what was that like uh, according to your research and when did we shift into a totally patriarchal consciousness? Well, ironically, and I think you'll find this interesting, 3113 BC is the beginning of the Mayan calendar, but it's also the beginning of dynastic Egypt. And I think uh, that patriarchal huh. Egypt started with the Mayan calendar and that we've had 5,000 years of this, you know, fighting and history the story according to him, and history is when the soldiers came and all of that. Now, when you say ruling, that also sounds hierarchical, but matriarchal cultures are not the opposite of patriarchy where women rule the men. Right, it's right, a right. a system of balance that insists on a balance between the masculine and the feminine, and uh, we, our school system and our value system has trained us to devalue all things feminine and symbolic, and if you can't see it, it's not here. But the Egyptians understood that we had to have a full deck the masculine consciousness developed within the female, the feminine consciousness developed, developed within the male. And uh, every temple has got um, a winged disc over the top, and the, it's the lower self has to surrender to the higher self before a person goes in, an initiate would go into the temple to do holy work. But the symbol of the winged disc is masculine consciousness is the snake, and the vulture with the wings, is feminine consciousness, and it's basically saying if you're not in balance, you cannot do the holy work. Mm. Mm-hmm. And there's much more to it. I mean, it goes on and on. But because we're looking through patriarchal lenses, when we and, and most Egyptologists are as well, they've been <laughs> pointing out and highlighting the boy stuff, as I say. And yeah, right. the feminine yeah. stuff is right in front of our eyes. And if right. you watch Hermit Code, the episode, The Empowered Human, you'll just see the symbols are everywhere. And once you can decipher them, then you go, well, I see what they're telling us now. I well uh, yes, and and the DVD it, it it just takes you walks you through this, and you can't deny the truth of it. Um, and also, you uh, have overwhelming evidence that many of these ancient color cultures, such as the Egyptians, were far more advanced than we are today. I mean, that's obvious just by uh, you know trying to figure out how they assembled these things. That you can't even put a razor blade through them even today. Uh, through the cracks, but they used sound and color uh, and advanced technology, didn't they? Well, yes, and when you think of how much crystal there is still wide open on sites that are largely restricted, mind you, but it's there, and that pretty much any device we have right now, 
um, a radio, a watch. They all have little quartz crystals. Mm. 